Hey guys, in today's video I'm super excited to bring to you an absolutely epic game I once played against the greatest Scrabble player of all time. Now, for those of you who are like, wait a minute Mac, you're not the greatest Scrabble player of all time? You seem pretty good to me. I really appreciate the support, and I do like to think I am quite good at Scrabble, but that being said, I am certainly not the GOAT. That title belongs indisputably to the great Nigel Richards. Now, within the Scrabble community, Nigel Richards needs almost no introduction, but for those of you who are not familiar with Nigel, Nigel is a five-time North American Scrabble champion, five-time World Scrabble champion, and perhaps most famously and impressively, Nigel has won multiple French Scrabble championships without speaking a word of French, which I think is the greatest testament there is to Nigel's seemingly superhuman word knowledge and word finding abilities. Nigel isn't Scrabble's goat just because of his nearly perfect word knowledge, though. He's also famous for playing perfect endgames in almost every single game he plays, regardless of whether it affects the outcome, and also for his very crafty and clever strategical techniques. All of these things are going to be on full display in the game I'm about to show you guys, so without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right in. This game we're about to look at was round 16 out of 31 of the 2018 North American Scrabble Championships held in Buffalo, New York. Going into this game, Nigel was 11 and 4, and I was 10 and 5, so we were both right in the thick of things, vying for the top spots along with many other top experts. So as with all games at Scrabble Nationals, this was a very important match. Nigel was first this game, and with a fairly clunky opening rack of I-L-O-T-U-U-Y, he started off the game with a very Nigel-esque decision right off of the bat. A standard play here might be to play something like the word U for 12 points, unloading the Y in one of the duplicate U's, scoring a couple points, and keeping the mediocre leave of I-L-T-U. Another option might be to exchange a bunch of tiles. Since this is a pretty clunky rack and it's still early in the game when you do want to be vying to bingo as soon as possible. So something you might do would be change five tiles, getting rid of L-O-U-U-Y, keeping the I and the T. However, that's not what Nigel did either. He did exchange, but instead of keeping I-T, he kept I-L-T-Y on his rack, trading just three tiles, the O in both of his U's. Now, this looks very counterintuitive at first because the Y is not a good bingo tile. Normally, if you're trying to bingo, which like I said, you're typically trying to do early in the game if you can, the Y is not going to help you. So why did Nigel do this? Well, the thing is, he does have the Y, but the Y actually goes really well with the other tiles he's keeping. Lots of words end in I-L-Y or I-T-Y, both of which he has on his rack. Also, one benefit of this trade is that if Nigel were to bingo, the fact that he has the Y, which is a four-point tile, would mean his bingo would probably score more than if he were to keep just one-point tiles with another exchange. So definitely a counterintuitive exchange to come up with, but it does kind of make sense the more you think about it. After Nigel's exchange three, I was sitting on this rack with the 10-point Z and a bunch of other mediocre tiles. There isn't anything great here, and I ended up playing Zig for 26 points, which looks like the best play. I could also play Zip for two more points, but the G is a considerably worse tile than the P, so it makes sense to sacrifice two points immediately to get rid of the G and keep the P on my rack instead. After my play of Zig, Nigel drew FIM to his leave of ILTY, so not exactly what he was hoping for. There are no playable bingos here. He made the very logical play of fill me for 23 points overlapping with if and gi, unloading a bunch of his clunky tiles, scoring pretty well, and keeping the nice IT leave. It's worth mentioning that I'm a little surprised Nigel didn't play fitly in the same spot for 21. It's two fewer points, but it has a really cool idea of setting up his M for big plays down the H column, hooking my. If Nigel can play a four-letter word starting with MI here, for instance, which is pretty likely regardless of what he draws, he's going to score a lot of points because he'll be putting the M on the double letter score and also reaching the triple word score. Nigel's well known for these kind of creative setup plays, so I'm quite confident he saw this and considered it and passed it up for some reason. I'm not exactly sure why, but maybe he decided that that spot was too likely to get blocked by me after Fitly because this board is fairly bereft of scoring opportunities other than on that triple. But in any case, very interesting decision by Nigel to forgo this setup and play Fill Me instead for 23. I didn't draw very well for my next rack. I had five vowels and an F and a P, so not a lot of great options. The two plays I mainly considered were Foo for 23 points, keeping A-E-I-P, as well as Opium for 18 points, keeping A-E-F. I ultimately decided to play Foo because it was five more points, and also the P is a better tile than the F. However, in retrospect, I think Opium might have been a better play. 
because while it is five fewer points, it gets rid of an extra vowel. It keeps only an A and an E on my rack to go with my consonant as opposed to three vowels, the A, the E, and the I. And Fu also creates a very strong hook down the K column that I don't have. If Nigel has an S for gifts or a T for gift, he could potentially have a bingo or other high scoring play down the K column. And without having either of these tiles in reserve myself, it might have been a little bit wiser for me to play Opium and not give that back to Nigel. But in any case, after this play, Nigel had a promising looking bingo rack, however there, fortunately for me, is no playable 7. He did indeed capitalize on what I believe was a small strategical mistake by me on my last turn, playing Todd for 31 points down the K column, hooking Gift to make Gift, and getting several other nice overlaps. This looks pretty clearly like his best play, it also now sets up yet another hook, Gifts, on the L column, and unlike me on the last turn, Nigel does have the hook himself, he has the S for Gifts, so he creates a very powerful threat for himself on the next turn. I did not draw an S, and I don't have a lot of great options here. The J is not a great tile, and there really isn't a good way to get rid of it. I could play something like Joy for 14 points, but that's really not great. 14 is not a lot of points, and this leave, while fairly well balanced, isn't really going anywhere on this board. So instead, I decided to score more points with a top, open some more space, and keep the J, which seems like a reasonable decision. On Nigel's next play, he again had a fairly promising looking bingo rack, but there are no playable sevens here. He's got a bunch of options. He could cash in with something like Snick for 39, burning his S. However, that's probably not the best idea since, as I mentioned before, the S is really valuable for the gift hook. Another nice option might be Crook for 27 points, keeping the very powerful INS leave. This is probably what I would have done if I was in this position, but interestingly, Nigel decided to play Kino for 28 points instead, keeping CRS. Now, CRS is still a really good leave. The C and the R go very well together but I would slightly prefer INS just because three consonants and no vowels can land you in trouble if you don't draw enough vowels on your next pool. But maybe Nigel had other plans with this play. We'll find out later. I of course still had the J to reckon with on my next turn, but this time I was able to get rid of it by playing Zhao and OK for 24 points. It's worth mentioning I could have also played Jog in the same spot for 26, getting two more points, but I decided that Zhao was better because the leave after Jog is a bit too vowel heavy, and also Zhao plays off another tile, which gives me a greater chance at drawing one of the very valuable blanks or S's still unseen to me at that point. Nigel drew a blank to go along with his S, however he has no playable bingos on this turn as the rest of his rack is a bit clunky. The most standard play would probably be Yuka for 18 points, keeping the super powerful DRS blank leave and giving Nigel a great chance to hit a bingo with gifts on his next turn or possibly something through the Y or the U in Yuka that he just opened. This is almost certainly what I would have done in this position, however that is not what Nigel did here. Instead of playing aggressively for a bingo with a blank and an S in hand, Nigel did the exact opposite. He got rid of his S by playing Cruds and Gifts for 19 points, only one more point than Yuka and keeping a much worse bingo leave, Y blank instead of DRS blank. So why would Nigel do this? After all, the Y is the worst bingo tile on his rack, and especially when you have a blank, you generally want to try to bingo with it as soon as possible. My best guess is that Nigel figured with three more S's still unseen, there was a decent enough chance I picked one up after my last couple of plays and might myself be threatening a bingo down the L column hooking gifts. So he decided that he'd be better off stopping any potential threats I had there while keeping the board tight and hoping to outmaneuver me on this closed board with his blank and his high scoring Y. So again, not the standard play by any means and probably not what I would have done, but really fascinating to see that that's what the greatest Scrabble player of all time decided to do in this position. I, however, did not draw an S. In fact, I drew quite poorly, pulling quadrupled E's, a G, an L, and a V. The best play for points and rack balance alone would be Verge for 19 points through the R and Cruds. However, this has a fairly obvious drawback, namely that if Nigel has a D, an R, or an S for Verged, Verger, or Verges, he's likely going to have a very high scoring play down the O column using one of the triple word scores. Especially after a play like Cruds, where Nigel used an S for only 19 points, which is not a very large score, I figured he was fairly likely to have another S and possibly a blank, so given that inference, I was especially disinclined to take this kind of risk. And as such, I decided to play it safer, playing the word ever for 15 points, so giving up 4 points and keeping the slightly clunky G, but not giving Nigel such a potent opening. After my play of ever, Nigel played the first bingo of the game with heavily for 79 points, making his blank an H. Now, it's worth mentioning that this was not a great scenario for me, but it could have been worse. If I had played Verge instead of Ever, then Nigel would have played Virali and Verger for a whopping 107 points. 
After Nigel's bingo sitting on this rack, I played Gru for 31 points, which looks like the best play. It gets rid of my G and W as well as one of my duplicate E's, scores pretty well, and also creates another threat through that G, which now that I'm at a deficit, I don't mind. Nigel didn't draw very well. He pulled five vowels, including three E's, and he decided to block that G I just opened by playing Genie for 18. He could have played Gained for 24, getting six more points, but it keeps EE, -E, which is a duplicated leave, as well as less balanced than ADE, -E, so I agree with Nigel that it makes sense to sacrifice the six points here to play Genie. I drew very nicely after Gru, pulling two S's out of the bag and drawing into a bingo of aliases, which plays only in one spot above the Wii on the board, hooking the A to make AW. So I played this here for 65 points, bringing myself back into the lead to 11 to 198. Nigel drew this rack here, and he has a couple of reasonable options above aliases. He can play badged over there or banged. Interestingly, badged seems more standard because it's two more points, and the D and the N are both reasonably good tiles, but Nigel here decided to sacrifice the two points by playing banged instead. My guess is Nigel looked at the tiles unseen to him at this point, and noticed that there were still three more N's unseen, but no D's. So that means if Nigel plays badged and it keeps an N, he's fairly likely to draw another N and get duplicate N's, which he doesn't want. However, if he plays banged and keeps a D, he has no risk of duplicating his D's because there are none left. So this play makes a lot of sense, and these little details often make a big difference in Scrabble, and these are part of why Nigel is such a good player. Nigel's play gave me one of very few easy decisions I had this game. With this rack, the best play is pretty clearly to just do a box for 43 points on the top right corner, hitting that triple word score. Nigel's next play, however, was far from easy. With a rack of D, E, E, H, N, R, U, and at a slight deficit, the most logical approach is probably to try to play off his H and one of his duplicate E's and possibly his U and go for a bingo on his next turn. One way he could do this is playing E for 28 above aliases. However, I see why Nigel didn't want to do this, because it could give me back a lot of high-scoring plays on the one row hitting one of those triple word scores if I'm able to hook L, high, or both. Nigel could also consider he for 21 points next to cruds. This scores 7 fewer than E, but it doesn't have the same defensive liabilities and also sets up another nice bingo line for him down the N column hooking DE. He might also consider id for 29 on the 3 row, scoring quite well, getting rid of his D but still keeping a fairly nice leave of ENRU, and also creating a threat from the H down the O column that I might have to worry about. However, Nigel did none of these things. In fact, he did the complete opposite. Instead of trying to bingo, he completely blew his rack up by playing Endure down the B column for 20 points, keeping just the H. Now, this is a truly fascinating play to try to comprehend because, as I said, it's so counterintuitive. Nigel is at a deficit, but despite that, he's getting rid of all of his best bingo tiles for just 20 points and also giving me a potentially large scoring play down the A column next to the second E in Endure if I can play a five-letter word reaching the bottom left corner triple word score. So what is Nigel's idea with this play? I think one thing to keep in mind here, guys, is that yes, Nigel's at a deficit, but it's not a very large deficit. He's only down four points after Endure, so if he can get a decent draw and I don't have a lot of good plays on my next turn, he could easily still come back and win this game without bingoing. He's certainly not down so much, or he needs to lock himself in to trying to bingo if he wants to come back and win. And the other, probably more important factor to keep in mind, is that there are several tiles unseen that Nigel would really like to get. The most obvious one is, of course, the blank, but also the S would be really helpful for Nigel for a potential setup, and also actually one of the two O's, because that would allow him to hook B to make OB and get a potentially high-scoring play or even bingo across the one row hitting the triple word score at 1H. And by playing six tiles with Endure, Nigel is giving himself a much better chance at getting one or multiple of these tiles he really wants than he would be by playing two or three tiles with the other plays we were looking at. So Nigel, by playing Endure and blowing up his rack, is conceding some bingo chances, but he's realizing he doesn't necessarily need to bingo to win, and he's either doubling or possibly tripling, compared to his other candidate plays, his chances at drawing some of the goodies unseen to him. It's worth mentioning that it also sets up his H really nicely, with potential plays down the C column making a. Uh. He could even get a bingo for quite a lot of points there, or even just a five or six letter word could score quite well. I don't think that's as big a factor as the other two I mentioned before, but still something to consider. But in any case, a very difficult play to come up with in that position, really counterintuitive, but I think the more we look at it, the more we can kind of at least understand where Nigel was coming from. So let's see how did this work out for the GOAT. 
Unfortunately for me, I drew the queue and didn't really have any good options for addressing the opening Nigel just created with the triple word score on the bottom left corner of the board. My only choice here pretty much is to play Chi for 31 points to the Ion Aliases. I'm lucky to at least be able to play off the queue and get a reasonable score for it as opposed to having to dump it for like 11 or trade it, so I was pretty thankful to get this down and have another relatively easy decision. And here we see another hidden benefit of Nigel's play of Endure on his last turn. If I'm not able to effectively use the spot on the bottom left corner of the board, as I wasn't, Nigel, holding his 4.H, is often going to draw a high-scoring play there on his next turn. And that's exactly what he's drawn here, not only pulling the all-important blank he was really gunning for by playing 6 tiles with Endure, but also drawing into the nice play of there for 38 points, scoring quite well and keeping the super powerful H-blank combo for his next turn. So surely Nigel saw this and played it very quickly. Wrong. Nigel did play very quickly on this turn, but he did not play there. He played something much better. Nigel's play in this position left me, the commentators, and pretty much everybody else who saw this game absolutely gobsmacked. And it's a play I definitely would not have found, especially at the time. I would have played there very quickly, as would basically every other top expert. But that is why Nigel Richards is the greatest Scrabble player of all time. So I'm going to give you guys a chance if you want to pause the video and see if you can find the amazing play that Nigel made in this position. For those of you who found it, major congratulations on finding a play that pretty much only the Scrabble Goat would ever find. And for those of you who are just dying to see this amazing play I've already been hyping up so much, Nigel did hear what Nigel does best. He played a 9-letter bingo from the No already on the board on the 14th row with No Wither for 94 points, making the blank a W of all things. This is Nigel's only playable bingo in this position, and of course, it is a lot better than there for only 38. And this catapults Nigel into the lead by 59 points, 344 to 285. And now I was faced with the seemingly Herculean task of trying to regain my composure after Nigel's jaw-dropping play and figure out how, if at all, I could try to come back and maybe still win this game. The most obvious option here, which I saw immediately, is to bingo with non-elite there for 60 points, which would put me back in the lead by 1, 345 to 344. However, the problem with this play is that there are 7 tiles currently in the bag. So after I bingo with non-elite, I'm going to draw 7 tiles, Nigel will have 7 tiles, and the bag will be completely empty. So it'll be Nigel's turn first in a 7 versus 7 endgame. And especially playing against the greatest Scrabble player of all time, who, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, is famous for pretty much always playing perfect endgames, that's a very weak position to be in. Nigel is almost certainly going to be able to play out in two turns. I'll only get one more turn, and he's going to end up getting more points than me and also get bonus points from my unplayed tiles, and it's going to be very hard to win. I figured if I played non-elite, the only situation in which I could win is if Nigel has no vowels. Because if Nigel has any vowels, the thing is he's going to have a very high scoring play next to the O in non-elite on that triple word score. If he has, say, the M, the P, or the W to go next to the O and he has any vowel to go with it, he's going to be scoring almost certainly at least 30 if not 40 points, and that's going to be more than enough to beat whatever I might draw in the endgame. So I figured after non-elite I was basically guaranteed to lose unless Nigel somehow had no vowels which was very unlikely but conceivable given that the pool had 9 consonants and 5 vowels, as you guys can see on the right. So it is theoretically possible that after his bingo, Nigel could have drawn 7 consonants, leaving me 5 vowels and 2 consonants in the bag, which might in some cases allow me to win in the endgame because it's going to take him a lot of turns to play 7 consonants if he doesn't have any vowels. So again, very unlikely but conceivable. I also strongly considered the idea of not bingoing here, and you might think, wait a minute, why would you not bingo? You can score 60 points immediately, and with all these one-pointers, how many points are you going to really get otherwise? Well, the thing is, if bingoing immediately looks like it's almost certainly not going to win, what I can try to do is forestall the bingo and hope instead of bingoing now, when the timing is not good for me going into the endgame, to bingo out. So if I say play like five tiles now, leaving two in the bag, and then Nigel empties the bag, and I can bingo out, then I'm going to deprive him of any more turns to score, and also I'm going to get a bunch of unplayed tiles from his rack added to my final score as a bonus, so that might be enough for me to win. It's an important tactic to keep in mind when you're down in these kind of situations, where it looks like bingoing immediately going into an endgame might not be enough to win. Sometimes if you can put off your bingo for a turn or two and bingo out and catch your opponent off guard that way, it can be enough to win. So I thought about that possibility, but I couldn't really find any plays that weren't bingos that seemed appealing. The problem is, if I do forgo the bingo, I need to make sure that on my next turn, a bingo, if and hopefully when I do draw one, is actually going to play on this board. 
And the thing is, there aren't a lot of places to bingo as the board currently stands. The best one by far is the right-hand side of the board through either the E or R. But the problem is, if I don't go there right now, Nigel is of course going to go there and block on his next turn. Other than that, really the only place I could get a bingo down is down the C column next to the letters in Endure, overlapping the U, the R, and the E. Which is certainly possible, especially given I do have the last E in the game for Re, but it's not going to be that easy to fit something there. The main non-bingo option I considered during the game was Lorne for 15 points, keeping the very nice E-I-N-T leave and trying to set up another line for sevens down the N column ending in E hooking L. This also stops Nigel from playing something through the R for a lot of points like Warp, which would also block effectively. The problem with this play though is it still leaves four tiles in the bag. So Nigel very much does not have to empty the bag on his next turn. He can just play off two or three tiles, scoring pretty well, and leaving me in the same predicament I was in before, where even if I have a playable bingo, I'm not going to be emptying the bag and giving him first dibs at scoring in the endgame. So I felt this wasn't going to really help my cause very much, and decided, after all that, to just play non-elite and hope for the best and hope that somehow Nigel would not have any vowels. But the question remains, was there anything besides non-elite and Lorne that I could have considered in the initial position? And if you ask Quackle Championship Player, the answer is a resounding yes. According to Quackle Championship Player, non-elite, as you guys can see, wins just over 4% of the time. Not very good, but as I said, it pretty much relies on Nigel having no vowels, which is very unlikely. However, another option, namely Niton in the bottom left corner for 20 points, allegedly wins just over 13%, so a good deal more than non-elite. However, is this believable? Let's think about it. One advantage of Niton over, say, Lorne is that it leaves only two tiles in the bag for Nigel as opposed to four. Leaving two in the bag makes it very difficult for Nigel to not empty the bag, as he could only play one tile if he wanted to avoid emptying the bag, and if he only plays one tile, he's not going to have a lot of options, and he's certainly not going to be scoring a lot of points. So in most cases, it's going to force Nigel to concede that if I were fortunate enough to draw an out bingo, I'm probably going to be able to play it and win the game. That being said, I do still feel Quackle is greatly overestimating the odds of me drawing an out bingo that I'm actually going to get to play. In almost all cases, Nigel once again is going to block the bottom right corner of the board. It's going to be much more likely from Nigel's perspective, with two in the bag, that I have a bingo through an E or an R already on the board than I have a three-way overlap down the C column next to U, R, and N, E. In fact, if we look at the pool of unseen tiles, I did a search and there are only two possible sevens I can draw from that unseen pool that fit down the C column. They are Petrols as well as Sethalor. If I don't draw either of those two bingos and Nigel effectively blocks the bottom right, which he should be able to do if he's careful, then I'm not going to have a bingo and of course I'm going to be down way too much to come back and win this game. And without doing the exact math, it's not too hard to see that the odds of me drawing specifically either Petrols or Settlor are way under 13%. So unless I'm missing something here, guys, I'm not really sure where Quackle is coming from. I think against proper play, which of course I should assume that I'm going to be playing against proper play from Nigel Richards, the goat of Scrabble. I just don't see how this wins other than when I hit those two draws. Because Nigel, if I'm not missing something, is always just going to block the bottom right. So... I'm not entirely convinced about Niton, but it's still very interesting that Quackle ascribes such a high winning percentage to it, so let me know guys if you see something maybe I'm missing with this play, or for that matter, if you see anything in the original position besides non-elite or any of the other plays we've looked at that you think might have given me a better chance to somehow steal this game. But I still maintain that there's no great path forward here and that non-elite is probably not an unreasonable try, hoping for some miracle that Nigel doesn't have a single vowel on his rack. Did I get that miracle? I did not. Nigel had two vowels. In fact, he actually had a seven on this rack of post-war, which did not play. And shockingly, not of course, I'm being sarcastic, Nigel found his best endgame of Strau for 44 points, making no and Ow saving AP on his next turn. Now, it's not a super complicated sequence to find, but it's still not trivial that Strau would be optimal. There are a lot of other options like Prow in the same spot that score the same. So the fact that Nigel found this very quickly, if I recall, he took under a minute to play this and knew that fast that this was best is still very impressive. I did find what I thought was a pretty impressive play here, though. I played my best play in this position. It was a little bit tricky to see. I found Amtrak for 42 points, making three overlaps of AI, Ma, and Toke down the E column, which for now brought me to within one point of Nigel, 387 to 388. But of course, with AP, Nigel went out. He found by far his best outplay of Pa for 24 points. Bringing Nigel's score to 412, and after getting two additional points from my unplayed U, 
The final score was Nigel 414, Mac 387. So there you have it, guys. That was my favorite game I've ever played against the greatest Scrabble player of all time, Nigel Richards. Now, I don't think I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I've actually played Nigel three times before, all at national championships, and I'm two and one against Nigel. So I've won two of those three games and lost one game, this of course being my one loss. But this was by far and away the most interesting game. Not just because of his no wither brilliance, but also just because of all these other really fascinating strategical decisions that Nigel made that I certainly would not have come up with, and I think the vast majority of other even top players would not have come up with. So really, really cool stuff. And one turn I want to look back on too is way back when Nigel played Kino for 28 keeping CRS instead of what seems like the more standard crook for just one fewer point keeping the more balanced INS. Is it possible that Nigel foresaw like eight more turns into the future and just figured I'm going to get a nine from this NO or through this OP at some point and surprise my opponent? We'll never know, but I certainly wouldn't put it past him and it'll forever be one of the great mysteries surrounding the brilliant mind of the greatest Scrabble player of all time. So that about wraps it up for this one, guys. I really hope you enjoyed the video and learned something from it. We don't have all that many games of Nigel's where we have all of his racks, so every one is precious, and this one certainly did not disappoint so many fascinating turns, so really hope you enjoyed looking at this game as much as I did. Thank you so much for all of your support and watching the video. Would really appreciate it if you subscribe to my channel if you enjoyed this video. I've got lots of other cool analysis as well as Scrabble games and other content, so thank you guys so much for the support. Once again, really appreciate it, and I'll see you soon for the next one. Have a good one. Bye-bye.